What a joy it is to worship with you on this first Sunday after Easter. On behalf of Swarthmore Presbyterian Church, I want to welcome any friends, extended family, and newcomers who are worshiping with us. If you are new and would like to learn more about our church community and ministry, you are invited to contact the church. We would like to know of your presence with us in worship. And if you're visiting us, you are invited to our newcomers gathering that is happening today at 11.15 a.m. Instructions for joining us via Zoom are on our website or in your Sunday's worship email. Next Sunday, our Lord's Day worship will be led by SPC Youth. Please tune in for the special opportunity to hear scripture proclaimed and music offered by the heart's minds, hands, and voices of our high schoolers and middle schoolers. On a Sunday after Earth Day, we celebrate all creatures, great and small. I invite you and your pets to a blessing of animal service on the Harvard Avenue lawn in front of the church on Sunday, April 25th at 4.30 in the afternoon. Joy, Sarah, and I Look forward to blessing those animals who are blessings to you each and every day. In just three weeks from now, Sunday, May 2nd, I invite you to consider the option of gathering outdoors in person for worship on Sunday morning. Beginning that Sunday at 10.15 a.m., we will be creating a worship space in the parking lot facing Loeffler Chapel and invite you to bring a folding chair if possible, a water bottle if desired, and even a friend or visitor. Our online YouTube services 
will continue as a reliable and safe option augmented by this outdoor opportunity when weather permits. Again, welcome all of you to worship. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Trusting in Christ, let us confess together. Resurrected God, you have made known to us the ways of life. Yet too often, we put other things above you, turning away from the ways of life and embracing ways of death. Forgive us and guide us back into your presence that we may know the fullness of joy. God longs to be in relationship with us. Despite our failings, God loves us and claims us as God's own. With joy, let us draw water from the springs of salvation. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on God's name. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Yeah. 
Let us pray. Guiding God, send your Holy Spirit upon the reading of your word, that it may serve to show us the path of life and lead us into your presence where there is fullness of joy. Amen. Our reading this morning comes from the epistle of 1 John, chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 2, verse 2. Let us hear together God's word for us today. We declare to you that what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testify to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare it to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Lord, our rock and our redeemer, our risen one. Amen. It feels like some days the most searching questions come after the light has been turned off. That was the case a few weeks ago when after books had been read and the light switched off, I heard this question from Maggie. Are the stories of Jesus real? Deep breath. Pause. These two are often my immediate responses when these deep questions arise. Questions with complex answers that she will likely ask herself and others more than once. Questions that show a mind at work trying to piece together her understanding of her world. I pause not because I do not know how to respond. I pause not because I fear in any way this line of questioning. I pause, I think, to let her know that this question deserves some thought. There is not an easy or immediate answer, as there might be to a different question that's asked repeatedly in our home, like, do I have to practice piano today? One piece of advice I got early on in parenthood, and I'm sure many others have as well, is to answer the question that is being asked. 
not the one you think is being asked. This has served us well in many instances, and I began there. Yes, Jesus is a real person. There are many historical writings that testify to this, and even other faith tradi traditions such as Islam include Jesus as an important prophet and teacher. She thinks for a moment and then, but are the miracles and things like resurrection, are those true? Another deep breath, another pause. Yes, Maggie, I believe so. But rather than a historical article of proof this is where faith comes in. These are questions of faith. Hmm. And so ended the inquiry for that night. But I know those wheels are turning, thanks be to God. Without curiosity, how could we ever make our way in the darkness to stumble into or around faith? In this second Sunday of Eastertide, it is the light and the dark in which we search, the faith that we stumble towards. This is the week we often hear of that beloved child of God, Thomas. Thomas, the disciple who needed to see for himself, bless him, to touch and to be assured, standing in each for each and every time that question resurfaces. Are the stories of Jesus real? We stand on this side of the open tomb and our responses vary on the range from joy to unease. On the one hand, announcing the good news as Mary did in John's gospel telling, I have seen the Lord, or fleeing as she did in Mark's gospel, seized by terror and amazement, because the prospect of life from death seemed too tall a tale to tell, not one meant for this world that we know. Esau Macaulay, a professor of New Testament, wrote in an op-ed last week for the New York Times entitled, The Unsettling Power of Easter, and painted an early picture of his experience growing up as a child in the Southern Black church tradition. Early on, he understood Easter as, in his words, the opportunity to don your best outfit, the yellow and red dresses, the dark suits against black and brown bodies of my church were a thing to behold. The hats of grandmothers and deacons' wives jostled with one another for attention. The choir had its best music rehearsed and ready to go. Getting to sing a solo on Easter was like getting a prime spot at the Apollo. One year, his mother was able to pull together the money to buy him a new suit for the occasion. He said he felt as though he had joined the elect as he sat in church that Sunday. That is, until, as he recalls, during a song, a woman sitting next to me with one of the aforementioned hats got excited. Our tradition called it ha catching the Holy Ghost. In her ecstatic state, she kicked out, hit me in the leg, and ripped a hole in my brand new pants. Dr. Macaulay goes on, that Sunday introduced me to the two Easter's that struggle alongside each other. One is linked closely to the celebration of spring and the possibility of new beginnings. It is the show that the church can put on on Easter. The other deals with the disturbing power, the disturbing prospect, excuse me, that God is present with us. 
God's power breaks out and unsettles the world. As Joyce said in her sermon last week, and as Florence Brown whispers in her ear each year at this time, he came back. Sure enough, Jesus came back. And here we are on this second Sunday of Easter, wondering just what all does that mean for us? Can it be true? what they say? The community of faith to which the epistle writer speaks in this first letter of John are not as close to the resurrection or to the resurrected Jesus as Thomas had privilege to be. They have had plenty of time to take a deep breath, to pause, to ask and to answer questions that were being asked, and to a significant degree, they have come up with divergent answers. What does the resurrection mean? Are the stories of Jesus real? It is difficult to believe all that the resurrection asks of us. It is a heavy lift for rational and spiritual minds alike. This is why we find explanation after explanation trying to figure a way through it. And here, having separated from the epistle writer's community, one of those ways through is to disbelieve the true humanity of Jesus. The word for this is docetism, and it was declared a heresy by early church councils. The docetist says that no human could live as Jesus did in such a way nor endure such things. The docetist says that rather Jesus was a spiritual being, a phantasm, a mythical one, mystical one. The docetist says that those who believe in him had, no, had fellowship in him that was purely in that spiritual realm. Thus, like him, have no sin, no longer want for forgiveness not of this world, not in this world, really, not concerned with this world. It is clear that the threat of disunity and dissension among these relatively new Christ followers is strong. And the epistle writer watching this unfold lands firmly on the side of embodied discipleship of this world in this world, passionately for this world. Beginning with assurances of corporal experience, what has been heard and seen, looked at and touched, revealing the light that is Christ who is one with God. We couldn't be blamed here for hearing tones of John the Gospel writer in this opening one who was from the beginning, who is the light. The move from here is to a direct repudiation of those neighbors claiming freedom from sin. If we say that we have no sin, if we say that we have not sinned, if we say that we have fellowship with him while we are still walking in darkness, these says the epistle writer, are liars. And there is no fellowship in Christ with these. One by one, the writer exposes the falsity and the consequence. We deceive ourselves. We lie and do not know what is true. We make a liar of God. Ouch. In fact, says the epistle writer, accepting the fullness of humanity and Christ's entry into it is the stronghold of Christian fellowship. <clears throat> Authentic Christian fellowship is characterized by the search for and truth-telling about our own sin. Christ is real. Our propensity 
to make poor choices is real. Christian fellowship, Christian community, church can be for us authentic space in which to grab a hand in the darkness and shine a light into the places we'd rather not acknowledge because we know that the light that shines is the same one that forgives. Forgives our sins, but not just ours, those of the whole world, individual, but also systemic personal, but also global. The epistle writer is realistic. Wouldn't it be great if we didn't sin? Sure. But is that going to happen? Probably not. Is the resurrection of Christ a blanket pardon for us to be able to do anything we want? Nope. But is it the assurance that when we do fall short, we have a way towards redemption? Yes. The fracturing of understanding just what the resurrection means for us and our world, just what it is to say we are disciples of Christ, humans in need of redemption, is true today as it was then. We are still trying to figure it all out. Deep breath, pause. The purely spiritual Jesus, the one removed from our experience, untouched by our pain or our joy, unconcerned with this world and cultivating specific lists for the next. We have heard of this Jesus, but I will admit that this Jesus holds no interest for me, no joy, no dis-ease. In fact, it is too easy, too easy to separate from the pain of a year of pandemic and the suffering wrought around the globe, too easy to tune out and assume the trial of Derek Chauvin does not speak volumes to the very human and systemic sins of racism and retributive violence. Too easy to think that resurrection is just a fairy tale. We assure ourselves with once a year in order to get to the next one. Too easy to stand aside. Too easy to point a judgmental finger and to let others figure it out. I do not want to serve a Christ like this, one that cannot really understand the true stakes of life and death. Are the stories of Jesus true? Yes, my child. Yes, my community. I declare that they are. I declare that they are not fairy tales but the foundation of truth in order for our faith to have any hands or feet or proclamation in this world in which we live, for any semblance of hope. We know what to do with grief and despair, Dr. McCauley continued in his op-ed. Hope, though. Hope is much harder to come by. The terrifying prospect of Easter is that God called the women to return to the same world that crucified Jesus with a very dangerous gift. Hope in the power of God, the unending reservoir of forgiveness and an abundance of love. It would make them seem like fools. Who could believe such a thing? Christians, at our best, are the fools who dare believe in God's power to call dead things to life. He goes on, 
The testimony of the black church is that in times of deep crisis, we somehow become more than our collective identity. We become a source of hope that did not originate in ourselves. After we take off those suits and sundresses and hats, we return to a world that is radicalized. The black skin that set nicely against those yellows and blues also makes us stand out as we live in a world that calls our skin a danger. We need more than celebration. We need unsettling presence. Friends, this can be our testimony too, if we'll stand alongside, claiming as true the resurrection of Christ from the dead is unsettling, particularly if we maintain that Jesus lived fully as one among us. It is unsettling because it means that power and abuse and death hold tremendous sway. But it also means that life beyond, life after, life in the midst of death is possible. Redemption is possible. Change to systems and to people is possible. But this is the good news of the gospel. This is the good news of the gospel. This is the good news of the gospel. As the Apostle Paul reminds the Romans, it is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us, who will, who will separate us from the love of Christ. I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Amen.
Let us respond to the word proclaimed. As we join our voices, let us affirm our faith using the words from a brief statement of faith. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children healing the sick, and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the deaths of human pain, and giving his life for the sins of the world, God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. Hello, my name is uh, Ken Hall. My wife Penny and I have been uh, members of SPC for over 50 years, and I am now just, I think, concluding my uh, fifth term on the property committee, so uh, I've been involved in this activity for a number of years, and uh, I have uh, seen it develop and seen it grow. Um, but what does the property committee do? Well, the property committee is responsible for the physical church. And as you know, our church is comprised of many buildings built over a long period of time. So it's a, a very uh, involved process. Uh, and um, there's needless to say, uh, a myriad of activities that we get involved in that are really uh, important uh, from just maintaining what we have and trying to do it within certain budgetary constraints, which have been you know, difficult at times, but it, it is an important uh, uh, activity that needs to be paid a lot of attention to. Uh, what kind of person serves on this committee? Well, historically we've had architects, engineers, contractors, and people with those typically, typical type of backgrounds, although not necessarily, and I would recommend those without that, who don't come from those backgrounds, to not dismiss that because I think it's uh, important to have uh, people with um, various backgrounds on the committee because you get different perspectives. Sometimes certain things that aren't as obvious, you know, to somebody that's close to something becomes obvious when somebody brings it up and presents a different perspective. One of the interesting uh, situations that were kind of like that was back, oh, I don't know how many years ago, maybe 12, 15 years ago, we had an incident at Loeffler Chapel that resulted in a lot of damage. And as a result, uh, we were required to get involved to try to resolve the issues associated with it. It was an opportunity for us to create an interesting space. And a uh, group spun out of property to do this, and it involved a lot of planning, a lot of actual physical work, and, an, and uh, resulted in what you see today. And uh, for me, that was a really great experience to actually start with the concept and follow it through to completion. So that's the sort of thing you get involved in, and I would encourage people to pursue it. If you have any interest in the physical church, and uh, it's important that you do, however, uh, because uh, most of the issues that you would get involved in will require uh, that kind of continued interest. Uh, hopefully you find the Property Committee of Interest. Thank you. The God who, sum who speaks and summons the earth into being now speaks to us, calling us to offer up our lives as sacrifice of praise. I invite you to make an offering at this time. Your offering may be made by clicking on the Give to SPC button on the church website or in the morning's email from the church or by simply mailing in your offering by check. 
please write the check to Swarthmore Presbyterian Church with Sunday offering indicated in the memo line. As we move to our time of prayer, as it is our tradition, we hold five families in our prayers. We hold in our prayers this week, Carol and Jeff Savory, Scott and Jackie Kennedy Sisson, Tom and Lisa Starr, Eileen Steef, Karen Taylor. And now the Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, our mighty counselor, our author of our faith, we come into your presence, Lord, seeking you, desiring to follow you and to be your disciples. O Lord, work within us, unsettle our hearts, our minds, so that we may be transformed to reflect your love, to be witnesses to the good news, and to testify to the fellowship we have with you in the name of Jesus Christ. For it is true what they have said, that you are a mighty God and death could not hold you. You took away the sting of death. It is true, O oh Lord, what they have said, that we find eternal life in your holy name. And so we ask that we may be witnesses and live into the grace of your resurrection. For your resurrection has brought us hope that one day we will be with you. For it is true that you are with us. O oh God, be with us. Through Christ we pray for the church universal, that your people may be a people of joy, living witnesses to the good news of your grace and peace, that it may be known that it is true, your people are witnesses to the power of resurrection. Through Christ we pray for the earth, from the dust of the damaged earth raise up your new creation, full of beauty, wonder, and glory. And we pray for your wisdom to help us care for the earth, for strength to protect your creation, and for a love of the environment. Through Christ, we pray for all nations. Let the message of your saving power spread throughout the world, that the dominion of death is no more. And through Christ, we pray for our nation. We know what you expect of us, and so we ask that your light may continue to shine, to shine in the halls of Congress, state and local places, and places of power, to be a beacon of light that calls and guides our leaders to strive for peace and justice. Through Christ, we pray for this community. Be with us, Lord. Give us your strength in this journey of life, that we may be witnesses to letting justice roll like a river, righteousness like an ever-falling stream. Equip us with a faith and a hope that has concrete praxis in changing the fate and circumstances of those at the margins. Let the doors of this loving community be open wide, that as we go forth in love and service, that others may come in to our loving community and find a home. And we lift all the loved ones in our community. Give us hope, O oh Lord, to those who wait for good news. Turn their mourning into dancing and their sorrow into joy. God of all power and glory, receive these prayers and continue your mighty work among us. Through Jesus Christ, our living Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Oh, uh -huh.
to the world in peace, have courage, return no one evil for evil, help the weak, support the suffering, honor all people, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit this day and every day. Alleluia. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you.